Hello, this is part seven of 10 in the Consuming Fire series. We're doing on hell and apocatastasis, the restoration of all things. Last episode, we jumped into church history on hell. For the first five centuries of the church, the predominant view of the final judgment was not retributive, but restorative. Most of the early fathers believed in the ultimate restoration of all things, apocatastasis, that Christ's finished work would ultimately be a cosmic success for all of humanity. So where did this change? How did the minority view of eternal hell uh, suddenly become not only the majority view, but now folks think it's the only allowable view to suggest God might be good enough, capable enough, and willing enough to repair and ultimately save all people is now considered a heresy. But whoever decided universal reconciliation was a heresy? Did the church ever at any point deem this a heresy? Absolutely not. Where did things get so horribly off the rails? Now, before we begin, we spent several episodes, two through five, going through reams of scripture. So don't get your knickers in a twist in the comments section uh, asking about the sheep and the goats, the lake of fire, etc., etc. I would encourage you, go back, watch these videos in order. Okay, we're not doing biblical exegesis today. Today, we're just picking up on our history lesson. In the fifth century, when the tide changed from universalism being the majority view of the church, at least among theologians who wrote, whose writings we have. Uh, but in the fifth century, this began to change towards the mentally ill notion of God torturing people forever. And we can mark it down primarily to the influence of two people, Augustine of Hippo and the Roman Byzantine emperor Justinian. Augustine, who was actually a fantastic, prolific, readable writer, who would emerge as the main theologian of the West. I mean, think Europe, America today. Both Catholics and Protestants relied heavily on Augustine as their main guy. And arguably, Athanasius, on the other hand, was probably the main theologian of the East. Think Eastern Orthodox world. Now, to jump from Augustine over to Athanasius is not like moving from Veggie Tales to Harry Potter. In fact, it's more the other way around. Athanasius was earlier, and much more pivotal and influential to the church. He's just ignored largely in the West. Augustine had a long past in a Gnostic type group, the Manichaeans, which believed heavily in separation thinking, dualism, separation between God and man, separation between heaven and earth. The nonsense you hear today in most of our Western churches whose gospel begins with separation from God which is completely contrary to Paul and John, who tell us Jesus holds all things together, that in him, even the pagans live and move and have their being and, and are his offspring. Anyway, this clearly shaped Augustine and his foundation. He starts his theology with separation, and his main text he starts with is, is a parable. I mean, parables are not the clearest of texts, but for Augustine, it's the sheep and the goats. For Augustine, it's about two cities, the city of God, city of man. It's about this separation from God and how do we or some of us make it back into union. Athanasius, however, in the East, who is instrumental in the church's creed, who is the defender of the Trinity, the great defender of the incarnation, who stood against the world, against the onslaught of Arianism, the idea that Jesus was less than God. Athanasius, who was exiled five times, who instead of hopping in bed with the emperor, was actually persecuted by emperors. Augustine, however, was the Roman emperor's poster boy. See, Athanasius started with a different set of texts as his foundation, not with a parable about farm animals, but with something more theologically clear, that just as all died in Adam, all are made alive in Jesus Christ. For Athanasius, 
He didn't start with separation thinking, but with the union of all of God and all of mankind in Jesus Christ. And then the question is, how does this work out from there? For Athanasius, God is supremely good and noble by nature. So, of course, he's going to rescue his creature that's spiraling off into non-being. So one guy begins with separation, the other begins with union. So the thing about Augustine in the West, and this is radically important to remember, Augustine did not even speak Greek. Augustine is translating words like eternal or eternal punishment, what other Greek fathers <clears throat> who knew the language of the Bible clearly knew to mean ages or an age of correction. Augustine is using the Latin word uh, eternus. All, you know, where we get eternal in our English language. All, it's all nuanced. You know, the, these words like Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, Augustine just uses the Latin word inferno for hell, lumps it all together. I, I mentioned in episode six how Augustine was 1,700 miles away from the other Greek-speaking patriarchates who were deeply familiar with the language of Scripture. And he's way out in West Africa, in Hippo, around modern-day Algeria, Tunisia. He's in a bubble, and he's relying on other people's translations into Latin. And he's the main guy who starts developing a doctrine about hell as being eternal conscious torment. Not to mention Augustine's low view of the body, his view of original sin, whereas the East acknowledges inherited sin from Adam, but not in this extreme way of total depravity that would develop in the West off the back of Augustine. For Augustine, it's through the actual physical act of sex, actual semen that sin is passed down. Uh, he thought unbaptized babies go to hell. I mean, for all the good stuff that Augustine did produce, and he did produce some beautiful stuff, he likewise had some extreme views and he has been a titanic influence over the West for 1,600 years. Uh, as Matthew Fox said concerning his continued influence over the West, he says the abysmal, theologically one-sided dominance of Augustine over Jesus and the prophets must cease. And as David Hart adds, quote, no eternal conscious torment to be based on a notoriously confused reading of Scripture, one whose history goes all the way back to late Augustine, a towering genius whose inability to read Greek and consequent reliance on defective Latin translations turned out to be the single most tragically consequential case of linguistic incompetence in Christian history. As Richard Murray writes, Augustine, who struggled mightily with Greek, claimed for years that the only meaning of Ionios was everlasting. Yet even he had to acknowledge his error when visited by the Spanish presbyter Orosius, who convinced Augustine of his error. Augustine relented, but only to the extent that Ionios did not only mean everlasting. Augustine still believed it means everlasting with regard to hell. It's quite probable that early Augustine didn't even believe in eternal hell. He developed his eternal hell views later in life in the mid-400s. His mentor and spiritual father was St. Ambrose, who clearly had universal leanings. Augustine himself acknowledges that the vast majority of believers in his day didn't believe in unending punishments. He, his was a minority view. Now, the earliest systematic theologian was Origen back in the third century. And everybody, I mean, everybody learned from Origen. There is no church father of any significance that didn't read nor was shaped by Origen. But Origen taught point blank and universal salvation in Christ. Hell was a refining fire, but Christ restores all people ultimately. Uh, Athanasius and the Cappadocian fathers, being Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, and St. Basil, uh, possibly the three most pivotal theological figures of the 4th century, together with Athanasius, they were all massively shaped by Origen. Even later popes, such as Leo XIII, he called Origen the greatest name in the Eastern Church, a genius. Benedict XVI calls Origen uh, the great master of the faith. St. Gregory of Nazianzus called him the whetstone of us all. And on top of that, Origen died a martyr. So, 
Augustine is clearly not in step with the great theological tradition that preceded him. Now, it was not until well after Augustine when Emperor Justinian, not a bishop, but a Caesar, called a church council and took it upon himself to anathematize certain readings of origin, which were in fact gross misreadings of origin. And it was not until then that this mainstream hopeful view of end things got supplanted by a much more dismal view, eternal conscious torment. Justinian, who expanded the empire by blood, sword, and oppression, preferred the minority view of Augustine, that of an eternal conscious torment view of retributive unending hell for the reprobates. A church and empire could not be motivated by the love of Christ alone. According to Justinian, people would grow slothful and disobedience unless they feared a God who literally tortured people forever. Augustine's minority view of the afterlife, which was inconsistent with Greek scripture, <clears throat> shifted to the mainstream, an ominous doctrine endorsed by the emperor to build Christendom and expand the empire by crippling eternal threat of never-ending torture. Now, a scholar named Procopius, who knew Emperor Justinian and worked for his general Belisarius, wrote an account of Justinian's life called The Secret History that details the bloodshed, the tyrannical pettiness of Justinian, uh, all this sexual deviancy in his marriage to Empress Theodora, these macabre demonic encounters of people seeing Justinian floating along headless at the palace at night. Now, now whatever we're to make of this, because uh, it is speculative, of course, but hey, the Eastern Church, they made Justinian a saint because he enforced Christianity by the sword. Anyway, Justinian loved intruding into church affairs as a self-styled theologian, and his views were often heretical. For instance, this emperor saint believed Christ did not actually suffer on the cross. I mean, still today, we love to mix our politics and religion. But the good news cannot be co-opted by lust for power, influence, or control. The violence of politics only turns good news to bad news. Politics and gospel do not converge, period. Uh, no Roman system will advance this kingdom. Business church will not advance his kingdom. We do not advance his kingdom. We are witnesses to that kingdom. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. Anyway, Augustine was the main influence on Justinian, the Roman emperor. Now, once Caesar gets hold of a doctrine like the eternal conscious torment view of hell, you can control the masses with a much smaller military budget. Just hire some scary, traumatizing priests. Uh, keep the masses in fear with ideology. Look, empire is the beast. Religion is the whore of Babylon. When they come together, it's never good. So an eternal conscious torment view of hell with God inescapably punishing people forever in literal flames. I realize that we learned this view at church from Babylon, but it is still a beastly doctrine. As Professor Thomas Talbot writes, for insofar as fear of eternal damnation and the power of excommunication backed by the coercive power of the state had become the emperor's primary means of social control, he could hardly tolerate a doctrine that would seem to undermine that power altogether. Justinian thus illustrates an important historical truth. Many religious doctrines serve, among other things, a sociological function. And over the centuries, the traditional understanding of hell has served one function especially well. It has enabled religious and political leaders to cultivate fear and to employ fear as a means of social control. That more than anything else explains, I believe, why the imperial church came to regard the idea of universal reconciliation as a threat, not only to social stability, but to its own power and authority as well. <clears throat> Furthermore, Talbot writes, had it not been for an obsessive fear of heresy grounded in the traditional understanding of hell, most of the atrocities committed in the name of the Christian religion would never have occurred. The Emperor Justinian, getting behind Augustine's version of hell, pushed his whole movement uh, to purge Origen from the halls of theology, calling him a heretic, 
hundreds of years after he had died a martyr in the peace of the church, after Origen had influenced every great saint. Again, the whetstone of us all. And Justinian ends up adding all these documents to a church council that were not technically part of a church council, claiming Origen as a heretic. The emperor did that. Let me reiterate, Caesar did that. But Christians today still mistakenly believe that the church condemned Origen and that the early church condemned universalism as a heresy. Completely, unequivocally wrong. So, <clears throat> let me touch on the fifth ecumenical council of the church, uh, if you want to nerd out with me for a minute, okay? Which, even today, some wrongly believe condemned the idea of universal salvation. It's heresy, they say, end of discussion. Look, no church council ever rejected universalism. So we got to get this asinine idea out of our heads that this is a heresy. Calling God a sadist is the real heresy. In fact, this council was a complete quagmire. It was a total cluster. Okay, I know many of my Protestant listeners could care less about early ecumenical councils, but maybe you should. Okay, before the East and the West split, when the church was basically in agreement, aside from maybe our Coptic and Syriac brothers, we should take seriously what the universal church agreed upon. Holy Spirit is present and operating in the church. I mean, the first church council you see in Acts, with the apostles agreeing on the inclusion of the Gentiles, and then you get the Nicene Council, where we get the Nicene Creed, that tells us that Jesus is the same God stuff as the Father. That's kind of important. Uh, you have the Council of Chalcedon, where we get the Christological language for Jesus being fully God and fully man in one person, what we call the hypostatic union. Uh, th this is not minor stuff. So it's important to see what was actually decided by the Fifth Church Council. And despite the emperor's distaste for origin, it was never suggested that universal salvation was heretical. Now, if you want a real deep dive on this, the best article to, de to date, I would say, on this subject is written by Father Al Kimmel. Uh, you can grab his book, Destined for Joy, and you can find his most updated article on this topic on the Fifth Council at his blog, Eclectic Orthodoxy. You can also read uh, the research from Dr. Ilaria Romelli, uh, The Christian Doctrine of Apocatastasis, is, is a thousand pages long. It's going to cost you 400 bucks if you can even find it, but fortunately the PDF is available free online. Forgive me, Dr. Romelli, I printed it off at FedEx. I'll pay you when we meet. Uh, she also has some more accessible reading books on universalism throughout church history that she did together with Robin Perry called A Larger Hope two volumes on that. Now, I am not going to go too far into the weeds with this. I'm going to do my best to boil down the Fifth Ecumenical Council for Dummies because I'm a dummy. And if you have further questions, go to these resources. The issue was not even Origen's teachings. Okay, uh, In the 5th, 6th century, you had these Palestinian monks who followed Origen's teachings. But they had spun off into their own strange ideas. And there were theological and political disputes over their teachings. For instance, even today, people think that Origen taught on the pre-existence of souls. That our souls pre-existed and then came down to dwell in physical bodies as part of the fall. Okay, uh, That's not true. Origen flatly refutes this idea at least twice in his writings. Origen is essentially echoing Paul, of course, that in some way we're chosen, associated with Christ from the foundation of the world. And he has all this stuff about logoi, words of being, us being words of God created. But he's not teaching the pre-existence of souls. Yet it seems that these later monks very well were teaching that. Another thing these originist monks are teaching, <clears throat> hundreds of years after Origen, mind you, is that our resurrected bodies will be spherical shaped, like we'll be orbs or something. I mean, there was some bizarre stuff. Origin is notoriously complex and deep, and people often just don't understand him. I mean, the man was a savant. He was at another level. 
Imagine being a human concordance before Strong's existed. Uh, his amount of writing and memorized recollection of scripture. I mean, even Augustine misunderstood origin. Augustine thought origin was saying that we would go in these cycles of punishment and then relief, punishment and then relief over and over again, which is total bollocks, okay? So even Augustine rejects origin for something origin did not even teach. Okay, and I personally, I have a public apology to make to Origen because I used to repeat the rumor that Origen lopped off his own chicken nuggets, you know, to be celibate or whatever. It turns out that was most likely a slander started by his bishop Demetrius, who was jealous of Origen because Origen was the first international theological rock star. So whether or not Origen's stones were intact, okay, he definitely, in fact, had a fortified set of gospel cojones, okay? So look, here's what went down. Emperor Justinian, who is not a bishop and who had no ecclesial authority, issues an edict. Now, this is actually the 6th century. I probably said 5th century. This is the 6th century already, all right? The 500s. Justinian issues an edict in 543 A.D., with nine condemnations against specific teachings of origin. Now, while these monks may very well have believed these ideas that were condemned, not a single one of these anathemas, these curses, were related to origin's actual thought. Furthermore, to our main point, it's clear that Justinian is no origin scholar. He had his theologians put this document together who also clearly didn't read Origen. They're just blaming Origen for what these Palestinian monks are teaching. And for all of the charges that they're scraping together against Origen, never was Origen's actual hope for the salvation of the human race ever condemned by the Synod. In fact, they praised Gregory of Nyssa, who was a very strong vocal universalist. They never censured Diodor of Tarsus, now, Diodor didn't even agree with Origen on many things, but Diodor was himself a universalist. Peniotis Similicus writes, Justinian had no idea who Origen was or what he taught. His advisors, Abbot Galatius and his band, had only an oblique knowledge of Origen's doctrines, namely a no longer extant 5th century book by Antipatris of Bostra which was studied by the anti-originists. Now, you, you don't need to remember all these names. Just get this. The guys condemning Origen had at best read secondhand commentaries written centuries after his death. So Similicus writes, the problem of what originism meant in the sixth century is a real one. Origen was simply a cloudy catchword used in order to either authorize or besmirch active people in the 6th century, dangerous and volatile world of imperial and ecclesiastical politics, the world of all these plots which made up the complex tangle of personal, political, and ecclesiastical relationships of the times. This is a dark period of palace intrigue, of concocting forgeries, of cooking up devious attributions to authors deemed compromising the imperial hegemony, of whisperings in corridors and shadowy deals. At all events, it was convenient to attack Origen. In the 6th century setting, hardly anyone was aware of his theology, whereas his name was a symbol used either to praise or stigmatize occasional enemies, rather than a well-perused corpus of writings. Attacking the name of Origen was an alternative for declaring oneself prepared to endorse whatever Justinian set forward as the legitimate Christian doctrine. In other words, an attack on origin by name was tantamount to declaring one's allegiance to the imperial orthodoxy. Now, the last of these nine anathemas in the emperor's decree said that, quote, if anyone says or holds that the punishment of demons and impious human beings is temporary and that it will have an end at some time and there will be a restoration of demons and impious beings, let him be anathema. Uh, this is often cited by pyromaniac proponents of eternal torment. See, the church condemned universalism. But let me remind you, these nine anathemas do not hold dogmatic authority. They were not part of the council. 
They were Justinian's own condemnation. They only represent the opinions of the emperor and his advisors. Richard Price says, quote, as regards the canons of 543, they were issued as an imperial decree and sent to the patriarchs, including the patriarch of Constantinople, not for their confirmation, but for their circulation. Their authority was imperial rather than synodal. And even here, what you have to recognize is that only one form of universalism was being condemned, and it was specifically connected to the idea of pre-existence of souls, something that these 6th century monks were promulgating. This cyclical understanding that souls pre-existed and then would eventually return to their former state. Uh, Herbert Hammond uh, Jefferson writes, In their first anathema, they condemned the mythical pre-existence of souls, and the prodigious restitution which follows upon it. That is to say, they condemn not the doctrine of restitution in general, not universalism in general, but that particular form of it, which follows Origen's mythical pre-existence of souls. Okay, it's only a type of universalism that's technically condemned. I mean, you could even agree with this ninth anathema and still be a universalist like Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, Gregory's not saying the wicked will be restored. He's saying the wicked will no longer be wicked. The false self is indeed destroyed. As Orthodox philosopher Nathan Jacob says, hence one could affirm that the torments of the wicked are unending in the sense that the torment and wickedness are coexistent. But should the person cease to be wicked, we would not say that the torments of the wicked have ceased, for the man is not wicked. In other words, his repentance has eliminated the referent, the wicked. He's not a wicked man free from torment, but a righteous man. Nevertheless, Justinian himself likely meant this against all forms of apocatastasis because Justinian didn't like it. Regardless, his nine anathemas are, are not doing the trick. And so the emperor calls together a church council 10 years later in 553 AD. Many bishops didn't want to go. They were forced under duress. Out of the 160 bishops, there were only 16 from the West. It wasn't equally represented. The Pope is needed to officially open the council, and he doesn't want to go. So he refuses. Pope Vigilius is literally kidnapped from Rome by the emperor, physically dragged to Constantinople by soldiers, ends up being imprisoned by the emperor there for eight years. So while they're waiting on everyone to arrive for the council, the emperor now issues a beefed up 15 anathemas against Origen, which he gets forcibly passed along the same lines. But who passes these? It's a local group of bishops, which is prior to and not even part of the actual worldwide church council. And so they have no binding authority church-wide, no outright condemnation of universalism by the church proper. Now, Origen's name gets tagged on to a list of heretics like Arius, Nestorius, etc. But they don't even say what for in the actual acts of the council itself. The acts of the council don't even mention these 15 anathemas because these were just pre-game deliberations that were not part of the official synod. And whatever they did sign was at the threat of force by the emperor. It's all under duress. The list of anathemas were just attached to the the canon of the council's proceedings, which were imperial decrees issued not by the council. They were added to the council by the emperor Justinian himself, and they get confused with the record. In fact, they even disappeared from the record for 900 years. They don't even appear in the Latin version of the record. So are you confused yet? Okay, here's the bottom line. Universalism is not condemned by this council, not by any churchwide council, not by a proper vote of the clergy. The version of universalism that was condemned by the emperor Justinian himself was just one type, and who cares what he thinks anyway? The emperor didn't like universalism, but several of the leaders who did reject the so-called Palestinian originist ideas, many of these leaders were themselves universalists. Is Origen even condemned? Well, yes and no. Origen's name gets thrown into a list of heretics, but we're not told why in the actual acts of the council itself. None of the 15 anathemas that condemn him even represent Origen's actual thought, and none of them are officially connected to the fifth council. I told you the thing is a quagmire, but medieval historians, 
not having access to the actual acts of the council itself, start assuming that Origen is condemned and jump to the assumption that his universalism must be condemned. And then they start adding other figures to the mix, like Didymus the Blind and Evagrius Ponticus to the list. And, you know, just because they're universalists. And before long, you've got this whole mythical notion that somewhere, at some time, universalism was deemed a heresy. Kimmel asks, but why blame Origen for teachings he never taught? Surely Justinian and his court theologians must have recognized the difference between the genuine teachings of Origen and the heterodox teachings of the Palestinian monks. It appears they did not. He writes, the doctrinal authority of Justinian's Ninth Council, moreover, is compromised by Justinian's clear intent to impose everlasting damnation on church and empire for the sake of social order, political and ecclesial unity, and the favor of God. The fear that apocatastasis would encourage immorality and civil disorder enjoys a long history. The threat of everlasting suffering can be a powerful inducement to obedience to moral norms, church dogmas, and the laws of the imperium. But social utility is not a theological argument. God's self-revelation in Christ as absolute love will always subvert civil religion and challenge the violence and power structures of the state. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. For this reason alone, emperors should not dictate doctrine. When they succeed in doing so, the church must be free to go back and reassess. <clears throat> I do not find it coincidental that this very generation marks the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe. After Justinian, the ancient Roman Empire is over in the West. Other empires will rise, wedded to the Church of Rome, and Latin eternal hell will prevail as the grand vision of the majority of humanity's future end. In summary, um, Robin Perry could sort of boil down everything I just told you <laughs> in one paragraph. He says it was the Emperor Justinian who really hated universalism, who called the council. There was a lot of controversy about the council. For example, the Pope wouldn't go, but he had to be there for it to count, so they went and got soldiers and dragged him along, but he refused to open up the council, which is what the Pope is meant to do. Anyway, Justinian was really determined to get through his anti-universalist thing. Before the council started, a lot of bishops are getting there early. They arrive like months early because they're coming from all over the world and planes were rubbish in those days. So Justinian calls them together and they kind of ratify these anathemas, these curses, because Justinian wants to give it the aura of a sort of a consensus view of the ecumenical church. And he sort of tacks it on to the end of the church's document. So guys, this is where eternal hell begins to take the lead as the majority view, especially in the West, which is backed up by Augustine. The East considers Augustine a saint. They just don't take him that seriously or study him that much. If a universalist view of Christ's work was the majority opinion prior to this time period, then it begs the question, why haven't we heard about this? Well, plain and simple. It's because evangelical pastors think the church started with the Protestant Reformation, and they rarely read much history prior to that. We get encrusted in the doctrines and confessions of our modernist denominations that were quite often reactionary movements asking the wrong questions over misguided Latin medieval ideas about hell. Now, after the Fifth Ecumenical Council, Universalism will progressively be viewed with suspicion, but it still has a significant showing in the first thousand years of the church among the greatest minds. Maximus the Confessor in the seventh century, who represents the very pinnacle of the patristic era, one of the most robust theological geniuses of the church, whose thought actually formed the basis for a later church council, although he's cautious with his language for understandable reasons is unquestionably a universalist. You have universalist thinkers all the way up to John the Scot Eryugena in the ninth century, who actually studied the ancient languages and the church fathers. Long after the fifth council, you had the great Syrian bishop, St. Isaac of Nineveh. And he was revered for centuries, especially for his mystical works on prayer and divine love. He died in 700 AD and was considered to be a hopeful universalist. But in 1983, 
a treasure trove of manuscripts were discovered. Works of his which were thought to be lost that rested the case that in fact Isaac was a full-blown universalist long after the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Isaac writes, the fathers tell us that at the hour when the saints will be attracted by the divine wave, they will be raised up to that beatitude by meeting our Lord, who will attract them with his power like a magnetic stone drawing iron particles into itself. Then all the legions of heavenly hosts and Adam's descendants will gather together into one church, and then the purpose of the Creator's providence will be fulfilled which he prepared from the beginning of the world, making the creation by his benevolence. To this purpose, the long course of various events of this world was prepared, serving to rational beings as to its master. And henceforth, the exiles of the kingdom will enjoy a life in peace in which there is no end or change. Beautiful. But now I won't get into the future threads of universalism. In the last episode, I mentioned many great figures from throughout history up to the present time who got it. Today, I just want to highlight where the train got off track in the 5th and 6th century, where Christianity became largely a thing of terror instead of liberation. Uh, Sergei Bulgakov says, uh, you know, he, we should strongly reject this fear of threat that, that, that seeks to coerce faith and repentance. He says, quote, striking sensitive hearts with horror, paralyzing filial love and a childlike trust in the Heavenly Father. This idea makes Christianity resemble Islam, replacing love with fear. Salvific fear, too, must have its measure and not become an attempt to terrorize. I'll tell you what, I will close with this little side note here as a freebie. Okay, because just as Origen's name gets impugned and blamed for what he didn't teach, there's another major figure I'd like to touch on in church history. Um, just briefly, uh, to address how his reputation uh, was also most probably tarnished by later writers. And that person is St. Basil of Caesarea. Even folks with uh, little knowledge of church history have heard of Basil the Great. At least the garden herb of his namesake. Uh, one of the most beloved saints in the 4th century. Again, one of the three Cappadocians, together with his brother Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzus. Basil was instrumental in drafting the Nicene Creed. Works by various saints uh, often get lost, misattributed, or altered, either accidentally or intentionally. Now, this doesn't mean we just abandon our study of the Church Fathers, because it's difficult. But we do need patristic experts to help you know, coax us into the worldview and mindsets of what they're writing about, the various theological discussions that are happening centuries apart from our own day. Okay? People often ask me, where do I begin with reading the Fathers? Well, I would say Athanasius, the Cappadocians, Maximus the Confessor. These are some of the greats. But quite often, I first recommend secondary resources to help sort of first navigate the overall theological landscape of the ancient world before you just dive straight into the primary source materials themselves. Um, I mean, I easily have 350 volumes of Church Fathers, and some are more challenging to read than others. You don't want to get bogged down, but dive in somewhere. Take it slow. Church history is important, and it opens our minds beyond the stagnant little tributaries of our individual denominations and our own time period. And there's a reason we did our Drunk Church History e-course a couple years ago, okay? And I'm not just trying to give a commercial here, but it's good to have someone walk us through the development of history because there's just so much information out there and we can get swamped. And people do cherry pick the church fathers to support their own opinions and their own doctrinal preferences. I mean, you've got evangelicals who love their hell so much they'll try to swear up and down that no church father was a universalist, okay? Yeah, and, and I'm a six-year-old ballerina. Come on. Anyway, I, I would agree with Alaria Romelli and other scholars that an injustice has been done to St. Basil's legacy. Uh, there are one or two quotes of Basil in which he supposedly advocates for eternal hell. But it turns out these are likely spurious, not really his, or misunderstood. For instance, Basil supposedly says that anyone believing in universal salvation is deceived by the devil. 
Well, that would mean Origen is deceived by the devil, whom Basil learns from and most extensively quotes from all the time. It would mean saying that his own brother Gregory of Nyssa is deceived by the devil, whom Basil helped ordain. In fact, Gregory dedicates his strongest work on universal salvation to Basil. Uh, post posthumously after he dies. It would mean Basil's friend Gregory Nazianzen is deceived by the devil. And it means Basil's own sister Macrina, who taught him the gospel, who was also a universalist. Was Basil saying that she is also deceived by the devil? It doesn't add up. In fact, the guy who is reporting Basil's beliefs to Augustine himself tells Augustine Basil is a universalist. And what do you do with this Basil quote? The peace given by the Lord extends to all eternity, since it knows neither limitation nor boundaries, for all the beings will submit to Him, and all will recognize His power. And when God has come to be all in all, after those who created disorders with apostasies have been pacified, all will hymn to God in a symphony of peace. Or how about this quote? He shows that earthly things are handed to the punishing fire for the advantage, benefit of the soul. In the same way, as is also suggested by the Lord, when he says, I have come to cast fire onto the earth, and I would that it, to see it was already kindled, and the people seen as burnt by fire will represent the human being. He does not threaten destruction, but he indicates purification in accordance with what the apostle says. If the work of anyone is burnt, this person will suffer loss. However, he himself will be saved, but only in this way as through fire. It sounds to me like Basil believes exactly what his mentors and family members believe, a patristic view of hell that is ultimately restorative, not the nightmarish, never-ending rage of Augustine and Justinian. Okay, now, now that you know who to thank for your decades of trauma, we're going to call this one a wrap. Meanwhile, check out these events before you go, and we will pick up again next week. We are made for community, but how do we do that when many of us are the church in exile? What is the church? We need a better ecclesiology, an understanding of the church. Coming up October 26, I'm doing a one-day web event specifically on this very topic. If you have trouble fitting within the four walls of the franchises with their propaganda, politics, and division, you love Jesus and people, but you're just trying to figure this stuff out, you're not alone. This is a one-day online discussion with questions. You can register with just any donation. So visit johncrowder.net slash church, and let's talk. For those of you who enjoy the in-person events, I am in the Midwest for one stop this year. We're hosting our Advent celebration again in December with Baxter Kruger and Matt Spinks in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's our big family reunion, so come get your eggnog spiked with the straight grace of an uncompromised gospel. Before that, my only West Coast stop will be a three-day weekend in Redding, California in November. And for those of you on the East Coast, New England, I'll be in Massachusetts for The Wine is Alive in October. I'll also be together with Baxter Kruger in Germany in November, followed by a fun weekend event in Basel, Switzerland, our only two European stops for the year. And finally, plan to join us on the mission field, bringing the party to the poorest of the poor in the Philippines. Register for our Philippines Joy Mission by this October. The trip is in February, but make your plans now. You can find all of these events and more by visiting johncrowder.net slash events. Also, check out our extended e-courses for a deeper dive into various topics such as Intro to Christology, Sacred Mystery, a course on contemplation, Drunk Church History walks through 30 hours of fun, colorful stories to expand your understanding of the past. Plus, there's our radically grace-oriented course on the book of Revelation. All of these are available only at johncrowder.net slash courses. Check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give full-length lectures, interactive discussion, Q&A sessions. Plus, you have hundreds of hours of archive teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So, it's a win-win. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. 
It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co.